the early spring of 1952, the Nevada Proving Grounds came to life again with the detonations of the combined operation Tumbler Snapper. Work went on around the clock in Camp Mercury, our atomic boom town, with more and more of us from all the services learning our way around the Proving Grounds. The Armed Forces machine for atomic testing was better oiled than ever before. To plan and coordinate all military participation, the Armed Forces Special Weapons Project created a special command, a test command for this operation. Like Buster Jangle, Tumbler Snapper was a combined weapons development and military effects program. A total of eight nuclear devices was detonated. Most of the military tests were run on the first four shots of the series, all daylight air drops. The bulk of the weapons development work was done on the four pre-dawn shots of Operation Snapper, fired on 300-foot steel towers on the 7th and 25th of May and the 1st and 5th of June. The big military subject studied in the Tumblr series was BLAST. Operations Greenhouse and Buster had shown that our previous curves for predicting blast pressures were wrong and that the error could be severe in war planning. Either the curves were wrong, or there were unknown variables in blast effects. Several things could be responsible. Possibly the shock reflecting characteristics of the target itself might be a factor. Thermal radiation might be heating up the ground and the dust laden air close to the ground in such a way that it would alter or cushion the blast effects of the reflected pressure wave. There might be other completely unknown reasons why our estimates of the optimum height of burst for an atomic bomb were wrong. To find out what was really happening, we set up a blast line, a long line of thoroughly instrumented 50-foot poles placed at 250-foot intervals out from ground zero. There were instruments to measure shock pressures and duration, air temperature and particle velocity, sound velocity, and time of arrival of the shock front. An intricate series of gadgets to find out what goes on when an atomic bomb kicks out fiercely at the world around it. Shot day, 1 April 1952. Zero hour minus 10 seconds. The drop plane has released the first weapon of the operation. And, as the bomb falls, smoke rockets are fired to form a background grid against which the expanding shock front can be photographed by high-speed cameras. This bomb is not a test of a new idea, but is a one kiloton device detonated at 800 feet for direct correlation with the low-yield bomb of Buster Baker. Tumbler, shot number two, 15 April 1952. This gadget, again one kiloton, was detonated 1,100 feet above the non-reflecting surface of Yucca Flat, thereby allowing us to compare results with the first shot fired over Frenchman Flat's smoother reflecting surface. Tumbler, shot three on Yucca Flat, 22 April 1952. Yield 30 kilotons. Burst height 3,500 feet. The same height scaled against yield as shot two. These two shots provide an excellent check on the normal blast scaling laws. Tumbler, shot four, 1 May, 1952. A 20 kiloton Los Alamos test device. Burst height, 1,050 feet. These four detonations gave us the opportunity to study blast characteristics over two types of surface and with three different yields and heights of burst. These tests verified the conformity of atomic blast pressures to the cube root scaling laws and gave us new height of burst curves for operational planning. Curves which fell between the old theoretical curves and those obtained during Operation Buster. 
But basic blast phenomena weren't the only thing studied on Tumblr. There was very little previous information on the response of aircraft to atomic blast, so a variety of planes were carefully instrumented, then photographed during each detonation, and given detailed study afterward. Trees were hauled down from their mountain homes and planted in the desert to learn what protection they might give against atomic blast and radiation. Dummy buildings gave us data on which to calculate the primary damage to city and military structures. Shot day. D-Day for Exercise Desert Rock. Designed to broaden the foundation on which we can reliably base troop participation in atomic warfare. Yucca Flat, Desert Rock Entrenchment Area, four miles from ground zero. H, minus 90 minutes. Throughout much of recorded military history, it's clear that the effectiveness of troops is geared to their psychological attitude toward the weapons used and situations encountered. These men are mustering for an atomic warfare maneuver, only the second series of its kind in history. They've all been thoroughly briefed on the hazards, precautions, and techniques of their tactical operations in the area of a nuclear detonation. Planning level observers from throughout the defense establishment have an opportunity to study the maneuvers from close range. H hour, minus five minutes. is the drop plane on its bombing run. The time of fall will be 40 seconds. You will hit the countdown from the bang away until the first time. Remain in your holes until the command raise has been given at H plus three seconds. If you stand up too soon, the intense light will temporarily blind you and the heat When the command raise has been given, stand up and lean against the rear of your foxhole. This will place you against the shock wave, which will arrive at this point at first time plus two five seconds. It is now eight minus two minutes. Everyone kneel down in your foxhole, look down, and stay down. This kind of experience is immensely valuable for any military man, and it will be a part of the tactical training for a great many Army and Marine field forces in the future. In the minds of many of the men, there was doubt and fear before. Now there is confidence. Confidence that comes only with experience. Just treat it with respect rather than fear. Use a little common sense and observe a few basic precautions. Then, with Tumblr Snapper finished and in the record books, the thoughts of our military and civilian planners were focused again on our Pacific Proving Ground, Enoe Talk Atlas. Here, in the fall of 1952, we ran the vitally important program, Operation Ivy. Ivy consisted of two shots, Mike and King. 
Mike was a notable step in the development of a thermonuclear weapon. For this powerful shot, observers were evacuated onto ships of the task force, which stood well out to sea during the last hours before the blast. Welcome aboard the USS Estes. As you may or may not know, the Estes here is the command ship of Joint Task Force 132. We have minutes to go before the first blast, Mike shot, of Operation Island. The time is now H minus two minutes. We've been here since daybreak. Left we talk last night during the early morning hours. Now, as you can imagine, feeling is running pretty high about now, and there's reason for it. In less than a minute, you will see the most powerful explosion ever witnessed by human eyes. The blast will come out of the horizon just about there. And this is the significance of the moment. This is the first full-scale test of a hydrogen device. If the reaction goes, we're in the thermonuclear era. It is now 30 seconds to zero time. Put on goggles or turn away. Do not remove goggles or face burst until 10 seconds after the first light. Minus 15 seconds. Minus 10 seconds. Niner, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, take The cloud is still rising. 70,000 feet now, the last estimate I heard is true. What this tremendous blast did to the atoll, nobody knows. One survey group is leaving here from the Estes. I can't go along, but you can, and see for yourselves, through the eyes of the camera, what has happened back on the atoll. now go back and examine the evidence and point up the statistical highlights. Remember those final last seconds? Five, four, three, two, one, T-zero. This is the largest fireball ever produced. At its maximum, it measures about three and one quarter miles in diameter. 
Compared to the skyline of New York, this means that with the Empire State Building as zero point, the Mike Fireball would extend downtown to Washington Square and uptown to Central Park. In other words, the Fireball alone would engulf about one quarter of the island of Manhattan. <laughs> The tremendous upsurge of air from the detonation rapidly pushes up the Mike Cloud. Again, nothing of this height and width has ever before been witnessed. If the picture is stopped at this point in the cloud's growth, the height of the cloud is approximately 40,000 feet. This means that 32 Empire State buildings at 1,250 feet per building could be piled one on top of the other before they would attain the cloud's height at this time, roughly two minutes after zero. Some 10 minutes later, the cloud approaches its maximum. At this time, the mushroom portion of the cloud has pushed up to around 10 miles and spreads out along the base of the stratosphere to a width of about 100 miles, while the stem itself is pushed upward deep into the stratosphere to a height of about 25 miles. Later figures put the mic yield at around 10 megatons or 10,000 kilotons. This means there was more energy released in this one shot roughly 10 times more than in all previous atomic blasts combined, including probably those of Russian origin. Or to put it another way, four times more power in this one shot than from all the high explosives dropped by the entire Anglo-American Air Force on Germany and the occupied countries during the last war. The results of this tremendous power can be shown at the Atoll. Here is an aerial photo of the test area of the atoll before the blast. And here is the same area after the blast, showing the crater caused by Mike. The outlined island in the center is former Ilugilab, the Zero Island. Sections of the islands on either side have been chopped off. The crater is roughly a mile in diameter. When it is illustrated that some 14 Pentagon buildings could be comfortably accommodated in this hole, the size of the Mike Crater becomes more real. Relating this area of damage to a city like Washington, D.C., would present a picture something like this. With the capital as zero point, there would be complete annihilation west to Arlington Cemetery, east to the Anacostia River, north to the soldiers' home, and south to Bowling Field. Complete annihilation. Well, the Mike phase of Operation Ivy is about over. The next and final phase, King Shot, will be an airdrop of a large yield fission weapon. And for this, I'll leave you to the air. Here the King Bomber, a B-36, levels off at 40,000 feet for its second try for a successful drop. The first, three days ago, was canceled in mid-flight because of poor weather. The radar operator, or bombardier, runs a continuous cross-check between radar and visual bombing systems until the critical instant of release. Height of burst, 1,500 feet. Yield, 550 kilotons. The final shot of Operation Ivy, a complete success. The coral sands of Anahuitoc Atoll have seen events in the fall of 1952 which less than a year and a half before were only hopes, little better than speculation. Today, they are accomplished fact, calmly accepted. This is characteristic of the progress being made in the weapons development program. After Ivy, we moved back to the United States out to the Nevada Proving Grounds. This operation, in the spring of 1953, was upshot not hold. The biggest program on record in number of shots fired, a total of 11 detonations. Since most of the shots were weapons development tests from Los Alamos, Dr. Clark has provided comments on a few of them. I want to emphasize that the amount of discussion given each shot is no indication of its actual importance. In fact, I may have to say at least about some of the most important shots.
The bulk of the huge knothole program, military effects test, was carried out on Frenchman's flat. Number nine on 8 May was the first knothole shot. All military tests on Frenchman were originally planned around this shot. The relatively high burst height, 2,400 feet, was a compromise to fit many tests rather than to inflict maximum central damage. Shot number 10, 25 May, proof tested another delivery system, the Army's 280 millimeter gun. When this shot was added to the program, some additional tests were scheduled to observe results of the low burst height, approximately 520 feet above ground. Extensive civil effects tests and over 70 separate military projects were studied with a severe limitation on time. This film can look at only a few of the projects. One novel feature was the first use of drone aircraft on a continental atomic test. Navy AD-2s were flown at near critical distances from several bursts to determine blast and thermal response. Air Force QF-80 drones flew their laboratory animals through the atomic cloud to determine nuclear effects. They were controlled by primary and secondary motherships, and manned fighter escorts stood by to shoot down any drone that malfunctioned. Other tests were conducted with aircraft components set up on the ground and with tied-down aircraft covered by cloth thermal shields. The action of blast was studied on houses, civilian vehicles, structural masonry, railroad rolling stock, including both steel and wooden cars, and many types of military equipment, both combat and transport. Testing urban fire hazards, three cubicle houses proved the decisive advantage of clean yards, sound wood, and paint. A forest of 150 evergreen trees was set up to study field protection against heat and blast. Mobile hospitals at different distances from ground zero proved the value of digging in and revetting such installations. Of great military significance, wind or drag sensitive targets received heavy damage from shot 10's low burrs at pressure levels that showed little damage on shot 9's high burst. This may happen because the damage boosting mock stem formed so close to zero in the high pressure region on low bursts. One phenomenon that seems to be associated with low bursts was first noticed on tumbler shot 4. High speed cameras picked up a new type of shock wave preceding the main shock front. Here it is again. This precursor wave, as it was called, registers on blast line instruments with a pressure time graph of this type, showing a considerable climb and duration before arrival of the main shock front. A normal shock wave with no precursor is quite different, hitting the instruments with an instantaneous pressure jump. The mechanics of precursor development appear to be these. A weapon bursts and thermal radiation creates an intensely hot ground layer of air, a layer filled with dust from what is called the popcorning of the hot ground. Milliseconds after the thermal flash, the incident shock wave reaches the ground and expands, trailed outward by the usual reflected wave. Then a new wave, the precursor, begins to build out from the base of the incident wave, racing ahead through the heated air layer. An intense dust cloud follows closely, rising initially to about 50 feet and later to several hundred feet. 
One important effect of the precursor is to lower peak static pressures without a corresponding reduction of dynamic or wind pressures. The precursor builds steadily in height, but does not seem to inhibit formation of a mock stem, though exact dimensional relationships are uncertain. Eventually, running into cooler regions, the precursor slows and is overtaken by the mock stem. From that point on, the blast wave structure is normal again. It should be emphasized that a precursor can form only if the ground air layer is sufficiently hot. And that heat was present. It should be noted that the heavy damage effects of this shot may be characteristic of any low burst without regard to precursor formation. Although high bursts are still desirable for optimum damage on many important targets, the tremendous destructive force of a low burst has brought about an interim restatement of damage criteria for drag sensitive targets and was the most important single finding of the military effects test of Operation Upshot Nautil. The end for the moment of the military effects story which began over eight years and 45 nuclear detonations ago. <laughs>